So, first things to do, well, first of all, why in the world am I standing up here, right? Um, I was in this room, I don't know, we were trying to figure out like how long ago it was, but I saw Maladoma speak in this room many, many years ago, and I have this funny thing, we all have some kind of funny thing, right? One of my funny things is that I have a tendency to follow people wherever they go. Um, so following in the sense of like going into the spaces that they travel into. And I had just been in a talk with a woman named Ama Bambo, and she's a bone Tibetan shaman. And that was an interesting place to go with this woman, right? Very kind of baroque and beautiful. And then I very shortly came here and heard Maldoma speak. And I was like, whoa, that's a little crazy. This <laughs> right? Like it was different. It was so radically different. It shocked me and made me pay attention. And then I didn't hear from Malbo. My, you know, we all go about our lives, and for whatever reason, we came into contact, and we've been in contact for quite some time. Um, and the East West Psychology Department was very gracious enough to have us come and co-teach a class for them. And so Jorge, who's right here, if you could raise your hand. Um, was the director of the program. He's now been gifted, um, stepping down from that. Um, but he was the <coughs> director of the program and, and made this thing happen. So if people are, are people students? Most people are students. I see a lot of students in the room. But are there people who aren't from CIS? So just being interested, you know, East-West Psychology being something that, a department that, that allows Maladoma to come here and teach and speak, and do all kinds of interesting things. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you might want to, you know, talk to Jorge, talk to Anna in the back or Heidi in the back. Um, yeah, could, lots of graduate students. Right. Lots of. There's also a. Uh, this is all part of a course that we're teaching as well. So a lot of those people are actually here in the room. So you know, taking an opportunity maybe to talk to those people. So thank you, Mr. West. Um, and without much further ado, just give me a little So, a greeting to all of you. And thank you for being here. And I'm going to also thank myself for being here. Glad <laughs> <laughs> you It's amazing that uh, what motivates our presence here uh, also demands a certain kind of structure that is a little bit odd, you know. Like, uh, you know, I had to come to this country in order to hear that I am a shaman. <laughs> you know. Um, and then the next thing, uh, I was expected to talk, you know. And uh, I keep thinking about what would happen if one of my elders in Dano were brought here and uh, asked to sit where I'm sitting and then talk. And I realized, first of all, he won't talk. Uh, he will expect you to talk. Which means that uh, somehow this uh, whole idea of talking because you are suspected to know something that uh, the other might not know. Um, feels more like a setup. <laughs> if we were a village, all of us would be participating to this talk. I'll say some funny thing or some scary thing. And, uh, 
somebody will be uh, triggered by spirit and they will stand up and uh, uh, echo that. And then uh, somebody will echo that person and it will go on and on and on. In the end, it's all of us that gave a talk. Not in any predictable order. Because uh, the less predictable, the more interesting. Problem is, modernity is about structure. It's organized in such a way that it tends to, to show that it's not really comfortable with the unpredictable. Mm -hmm. uh, because the unpredictable tend to look like it doesn't want to be regulated. <laughs> You see what I mean? And so other results, we have to wonder the depth of toll that it takes on the spirit inside of us that like to be completely free to fool around whichever direction it chooses to. You see? And yet at the same time, Whenever we are by ourselves, we realize that there is something else about us that is not quite modern, that is not quite regulated. Somehow, we end up calling the spirit in us. It is probably uh, the indigenous in us, uh, although we still have to figure out what all that means, but in the end, we know deeply that uh, some other subtle forces, some other system are riding along with us. Uh, I like to call those uh, type of energies ancestors. I like to call them maybe the spirit of earth, the spirit of nature. Uh, the spirit of a power animal, which in my culture we call Siura, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and so, when we sit like this, uh, what I am called to talk to you about does not make me any more special than what you are called not to speak to me about. <laughs> uh, it's just that this culture is notorious about structure and has it so well ordered that uh, it, it worked to a fault, uh, to the point where there is a certain dangerous energy associated with it. It takes many forms, but some of the most visible form is a delegation of power and authority onto someone who might be even deep down more scared than you. Uh, and having or expecting that one to lead when in fact, whenever you think you need a leader, if you had the idea of going to a mirror, you would see the leader you're looking for. Mm -hmm. In a way, what I'm trying to say is that we don't always come together like this in order to hear the voice of one person telling us uh, something that is, in the end, maybe an opinion. We come here as if we're going to a symphony, uh, to a concert. Some of, it, some of us are sopranos, others are altos, the tenors are there, and the, the, the grandfather ba uh, bass is always lurking in the back. Either way, there is a specific gate that we occupy every time we join together like this. 
This is what I call, I like to call community. I like to call it community simply because uh, what it says is that uh, it is only in the presence of others that we can get to witness the kind of gift that we have. Similarly, it's only within that context when we are dancing or doing whatever we do with our gift that we give community the chance of doing what community does to acknowledge, to honor, to recognize that this is uniquely associated with us and this is something that serves the wellness of community, period. So, uh, in this kind of context, we bring ourselves to any context as a participant, a contributor, or should I say, a healer. And if we know a little bit about our what I may call indigenous self. Uh, we will know that uh, <coughs> that indigenous self always want to be seen as an equal contributor, an equal participant in any kind of dynamic that is there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but in my village, uh, when you are offering an opinion and somebody sneezes, it's a spirit that goes to that person to tell you, right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. You know, I, I was starting to be concerned. <laughs> so, because the Dagara people believe and live by the fact that in order to be a village, people, gifts, and purpose have to be explicit. It has to be there. Gift motivates the presence of community because gift goes to work when gift is seen. And a community's responsibility is to be able to see, to see the gift carried by each participant in order for the individual to see that the, the noticing of the gift is more like a fertilizing of that gift because it brings it alive. When gift is not acknowledged. It is almost like it is hurled into the darkness, the penumbra, this kind of somber box. And the message is that it's not time yet to come out. For a lot of us, a lot of people, they've spent several decades waiting for some kind of community to tell their gift, it's okay, come right in was finally bought the red carpet for you. Something like that. And so to be in a context uh, so modern, and yet to have the feeling that an indigenous energy is kind of rattling in the background is a suggestion of the, uh, of the strength of the indigenous, even in the heart of a culture that tend to ignore it. And particularly for those of you that don't have a problem walking with it, uh, having accepted their own weirdness in the eyes of modernity. You know, because when you look your indigenousness, Somehow, you, you come across a 
really odd. Um, um, and that's at best, you know, uh, because there could be worse things. Uh, the issue is that um, for some of us, they can't help it. They, they, just, they just can't. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a force in them that is so intimately connected with their identity that if they don't do that, they're going to find their life fall apart. For others, they notice that there's something viable in acknowledging this part of them. But then the conditioning of the culture tend to demand from them to stay away from this because it's kind of spooky. It cannot be uh, dignifying to abide by this peace in us that we call the indigenous. Um, having spoken about it, it feels like, you know, the word is used and misused whichever way people, uh, people want. But when I say indigenous, I simply mean something inside of us that is indelibly earth-based. Uh, a mirror of what nature is. Riding along with the elements that are present in this dimension some part of us that is so ancient that if you if you have a way of carbon dating it you will realize that it was there when this dimension came into existence being that ancient means that uh, it has a timeless memory and that memory is like an independent consciousness competing against the consciousness of post-modernity. And when the voice of the culture is less prominent, it is that voice that you hear inside of you. For some people, it has become so much more louder uh, that uh, it forces them to abide by a certain kind of rhythm that other people find odd, weird, eccentric. Uh, at best, they classify them as, uh, you know, people to let go of. You know, they're no use because they will always act weird. Uh, but in certain kind of circumstances, uh, this is a signal of the presence of something about this world, this dimension that re is refusing to go away. In the midst of anything to the contrary, it refuses to go away. Uh, it is important if you want to notice this kind of trend in people to see what kind of language lights up people. For some people, if you start talking about, uh, about magic and nature, all of a sudden, you get their attention. For others, maybe it's, uh, it's gadgetry, you know, uh, stuff uh, like cell phone, uh, smartphone, or you know, some technological sophisticated piece. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, when you have a way of seeing presence, life in things that normally would be seen as lifeless, something is wrong with you in a good way. <laughs> uh, it means that certain kind of basic frequencies uh, that uh, this culture would rather mute 
In fact, the culture has failed to mute them in you. And somehow, I think that in this day and age, when you want to be realistic about the state of the world that we live in, you will, you will acknowledge that somehow, having fallen through the cracks of conditioning and lobotomizing, uh, somehow puts you at a level of uniqueness that comes with that much more responsibilities. You will find yourself having to go left when everybody else is going right. To go down when everybody else is going up. And more importantly, you won't find a problem with that. <laughs> Which means, therefore, that uh, a part of you has become more and more surrendered to a process the kind that the mind has been ordered not to analyze, not to think about, but the kind that the heart and the spirit understand fully. And I believe that that's what participating in the continuity of the indigenous in this day and age should mean. That somehow what you are doing has a stamp that is not dictated by the general cultural trend. But that you cannot even explain logically to anybody why or how you came about this. Of course, this is not an easy uh, frequency to, to embrace. It's not an easy place to be because uh, in a context in which everybody yearn to be part of a community, to be seen and acknowledged, there's something about the seeing and the acknowledging that doesn't come without a price. It means that for for some cultures, and I'm thinking modern cultures when I say some cultures, in order for you to be acknowledged, sometimes there's a big chunk of yourself that you have to let go of. It means that you have to abide by certain rules and regulations. Most of them may not be suitable to a part of yourself that you know deep down doesn't want any of this. But then you weigh that against the longing for belonging, the longing to be acknowledged, to be seen. And you say, well, it's a hefty price to pay. But at least I get this in return. But eventually when you go down that road, yes, you can make it through the, all this, all this, the, the ladders of society and uh, uh, be labeled essentially as a success all the way till retirement when everything gets quiet you look at your life and you realize you've left it somewhere and you've been riding on someone else's horse and now the horse is so much welded into you that you can't jump off At that time, basically, you have no one to go and talk to. And even if you do, there is something of that force of prohibition that would come up with all kind of argument to tell you, but look what you have accomplished. You've been a good citizen. Uh, paid your, your debt, your mortgage, uh, your insurances, and so forth. And now you are in retirement. So enjoy. Anyway, I don't want to paint too bad a picture. I just, I just, I just I was riding with an idea and then he abandoned me. Uh, 
what I had in mind when I, when I bumped into this was the fact that uh, uh, the idea of us coming into this world with a gift and to the point where we are a gift to this world. It's something that struck me uh, when I first became a student of the culture of my people. That each one of us could be seen as the cargo bay of a lot of goodies stored in there. And that we had arrived in this, in this whole village, in this whole community, carrying that load of goodies. And all that we want to do is to be able to give it here and there and watch the faces of the recipient lights up as we touch them in this specific manner. When you think about it in this term, I mean, forget all these labels uh, or names of specialties that uh, has ended up being uh, a, a part of the culture. Like, you know, you're the healer, uh, caretaker, you're a nurse, and this and that. But think for a moment about yourself as a gift, a cargo of gift come into this world, or should I say, set to this world, in order to embellish it. Think about what would happen to you when a whole community looks at you that way. <clears throat> there is something that will make you be that gift. You don't have to have been trained at any given school. You don't have to, to have received any certificate or diploma of any sort. You will think of yourself as being born with the diploma, with the certificate. <laughs> and your very presence in this world is motivated by one desire, to take office. <laughs> Something about that elevate the human being in a way that is very, very exhilarating uh, when checked against all the pressures, the gauntlet that uh, modernity wants us to go through in order to qualify for being seen partially. <laughs> the implication is that a lot of us really have their gift uh, so saddened by the general ostracism that somehow they went to sleep. And those people have found themselves so alienated by any structure, any institution, that in the end, the frequency that they needed in order to show how much of a genius they are, those frequencies evaporate whenever they find themselves under the umbrella of a structure that expect them to be this way while their spirit tell them to be that way. What does that say? Well, it says that uh, more often than not, the one who establish the structure for the purpose of telling others where, uh, where they should go, what they should be, is probably more problemed than the one that is being told to go that direction. You see what I'm trying to say? Uh, Zane and I were having some wild conversation this afternoon following my arrival in Oakland. And uh, one of the things that we, were bump, we bumped into was uh, the subject of colonialism and uh, uh, cultural predation. 
Um, we wound up talking about um, you know gated communities, uh, personal properties, and uh, the psychological meaning of the sign "Do not trespass," or they say "No trespassing" in red. Uh, And the, uh, the picture came to me really clearly. You know, when a culture has, this is not a sneeze, but when a culture has had the tradition of uh, impinging upon other cultures, uh, taking them, disrespecting, destroying other cultures, the psyche of such a culture knows the pain it has inflicted. And the psyche of that culture is going to send message to the mind to preemptively take initiative to prevent that from happening to itself. You understand what I mean? If you are a colonizer and have learned and witnessed and, and executed act of colonization in the course of which you witness the pain that you inflicted on others, the, the, the destruction that you brought as a gift to others, your psyche is going to tell you, Mind, mind, mind. Beware, because you know the saying, don't do unto the other what you don't want other to do unto you. And that same psyche is going to prompt you to create a system of prevention which is going to come across looking like no trespassing. Uh, this is my property. Uh, uh, alarm system. Insurance policy. I don't know how many are on the list, but uh, you can go down that road, you'll see. It is not necessarily that this is something that would do you any good. It is directly a response to an order based on experience that makes it logical that such disposition be set in place lest you become the colonized. And so in a way, there is a reversal here a reversal of uh, energy that indeed put someone who was once a reckless taker uh, and solicited, by the way, to become a restless soul as if somehow there's a voice that says what you did will be done upon you. Something like that. So when this kind of thing happened, uh, what it does to an entire culture is what uh, uh, in Dagger culture uh, has ended up being labeled with a specific name. It is looked at as a disease, as an illness, a disease of the spirit and a disease of the soul. Uh, the word of it is dumpular. I don't know how to spell it because I've never seen it written somewhere. I've always heard it. And so uh, if I'm going to spell it, I'm going to spell it my way. D-U-M-P-L-O, something like that. So what is dumpular, in fact? It is, it is something that Dagara people, as colonized people, have come to experience. And uh, the shaman have ended up putting their finger on. It is based on the idea that uh, 
we come into this world with a gift that we intend to contribute to the beautification of uh, community, of village, of tribe. Unfortunately, we arrive here and find out that the way that the condition in the village were described while we were there don't match. That somehow the condition that we wanted to be in place so that we can go to work are not there. So we go back to the text of our, uh, our contract, our promise. Uh, we call it purpose. You know, every purpose comes with a text. And we begin heavily editing things. You know, I didn't get the I didn't get the red carpet, so paragraph two out. Um, and then nobody's recognizing my gift, so I'm not gonna do this, so I cross over page two. You know, that's out. What we don't know is that what was agreed upon in one world to be executed in another world can only be changed in the world where it was signed. It is not subject to change upon arrival <laughs> because that was not written in the contract. It didn't say keep dropping line as circumstances demand, <laughs> or something like that. And so what happened is that we find people who've, who are always constantly confronted with the same type of failure, and they keep trying. Most common relationships don't work. And yet the idea of it is so great that you cannot imagine yourself not trying. And so then you become more defined in terms of your failures than in terms of your success. Whatever you want to set up that is going to be even remotely a reflection of the greatness you carry inside of you, turn out to be the opposite. As if somehow there is a demon that is constantly keeping an eye on all the ideas, the good ideas you come up with, and makes it a point to defeat them. This is what Tagore people call don't pull up. Because it's not conceivable that you were granted the inalienable right to come into this world to be the archetype of failure. You could do that somewhere else more leisurely. You know. um, and so when there is more and more of the same thing on a daily basis, then a shaman in Dagger Land will say, hey, we've got to look at that contract. We've got to take a look at that contract. Which part did you delete? <laughs> you got to take an eraser and erase the, the line that you cross so that you can restore the text to its original purity. Otherwise, nothing can be done. And because the text is, is said to be written all over us, that uh, restoration happened within the context of ritual. It's a ritual that is done to, to cleanse the graffitis that you, uh, you burden the otherwise pure text of your presence in this world with that is wiped out. I remember 10 years ago having this kind of idea come into my mind. I realized, oh, what Dagara people call individual dumpler uh, can become a whole cultural dumpler. Meaning that an entire culture has dumpler. How do you heal that? Uh, this is a kind that is yet 
to be uh, looked into. It means that there have to be enough people who are clean from Dumpula in order to gang up against the Dumpula of the culture. <laughs> right? Something of that nature, I don't know. And so, this is perhaps the reason behind people realizing that somehow they have not been acknowledged. They have not been seen. They feel homeless in their own country. They feel ostracized. And they refuse to give up. They refuse to abide by the consequences of being ostracized, of being invisible, of being homeless, and make themselves committed to walking as a human in a quest, some kind of ongoing, open-ended quest, the quest for home, the quest for belonging, the quest the quest for acknowledging the innate gift. And I can tell you, these people, sooner or later, bump into it. They break into a context in which they can hear the voices of, of trees standing there. They can hear the voices of the, of the ancestor telling them what they need to do. They can feel the earth underneath them rattling every time they put their foot in there. And that is the beginning of the end of the search for home. Which means that uh, it is not us human who can heal. It is not us human who can cleanse. It's us human who can serve as conduit to whoever has that capacity that we can't see, but sometimes we feel, we can't hear, but sometimes we sense. It is through, therefore, this, this collaboration that healing like this can happen. So that leads us to this kind of interesting place. What is, therefore, the anatomy of healing. What is the anatomy uh, or the structure of healing? Is this something that can be dissected and understood logically? Or is it something that comes with its own logic, some of which cannot be grasped by the mind? I'll go for the latter. <laughs> Because too many things have happened, for instance, in my own life, I have no way of understanding them from, from up here. But somehow, deep down, it feels like there's somebody who knows that. What else were you thinking? That's the most normal thing that could have happened. Is it? It is that part that I like to refer to as my indigenous self. Because it has a way of knowing things that the mind cannot grasp. And therefore, if we want that everything that we do be fitted into an idea of comfort, an idea of goodness, we have to think. Where did we get that idea? Who either inoculated us with it as part of a larger project of conditioning? And in that context, be careful. Be more discerning. Be more conscious. When that happened, eventually, this constant self-questioning leads to a place where the voices of the other world start to take over. At that time, you may feel like you're getting nuts 
or something is really wrong with you. But what else is new? <laughs> Those who most feel that something is wrong with them are the most right. Uh, which is why sometimes when we are on track, riding down the road dictated by spirit, we know it because all hell break loose around us. <laughs> Nobody likes us. Uh, <laughs> everybody stare. Uh, <laughs> why not sometime therefore look at that and nod and say yes. <laughs> Keep confirming that I'm going the right direction. <laughs> On the other hand, what we want everybody to just say, fine, you're doing good. Everything is cool. You know, it's like what they say, um, you're riding first class too early, which means you're going to hell. Because next time the train stops, you better not get out, because it's not a good destination. So all I'm trying to say is that uh, given the, the cultural dumpla we're all bathing in, any person will know that they are getting out of it when they look around and, excuse me, the shit is all over the place. Uh, the, point is, the point is that uh, it, it cannot look good if it is true. And that may sound contradicting, but uh, you can tell even when you look at the mirror how weird you yourself look <laughs> and use that as a sign that gee you gotta like this guy <laughs> whoever this guy is <laughs> and this is why what I've learned from my uh, from my elders in Dagger land is that the more trouble they are that they're in, the funnier they get. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how all oh, hell can be breaking loose, and they're, they're cackling and laughing, acting like, you know, what else is new? <laughs> On the one hand, the predator is thinking that he's winning, and the victim is celebrating because it knows that what the predator is doing. The predator does not know that it's confirming that the prey is doing the right thing. You know what I mean? And so this is the kind of trick we sometimes have to do upon ourselves in order to avoid falling under the dictate of a structure that is not interested in our, in our best spirit, but he's interested in something else, self-service. Um, why are we talking about all this? <laughs> well, the, 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 the thing about it is that, uh, you know, we started this conversation with the, uh, decrying the fact that, you know, uh, you, you know, somebody has to talk, you know, and uh, everybody else has to shut up and listen. Uh, when in fact this contradicts the fact that there's a spirit, there's a, there's a genius in each one of us that demand that a good talk be participatory. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is this probably the reason why I've never seen a talk in my village? I've never seen an elder sit people down like this and lecture them for 45 minutes. No. At the risk of being th thrown a rotten tomato at, the point is that um, even the elder doesn't have enough to line phrases after phrases together in an, in an organized fashion for 45 minutes. So, this 
raises a question. Is our smooth linguistic capacity a signal that we, are, we have lost something? To be a good talker might be a, a reverse blessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one who told me to talk. <laughs> hey, I forgot. Okay. Uh, so, the point is, the indigenous self is more vested in doing, is more interested in this kind of collaborative journey, whether it is with spirit or with others. Because it is in this kind of context that the gift within has the capacity to come out. And I see my gift much better when it mirrors your gift. And how would I see that unless I engage you in a space in which you contribute, I contribute so that we all look like we are participating in a grander scheme, something much bigger than the sum of all of us together. Does that make sense to somebody? Uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense to me, but I just feel that I have to say it. Uh, so, uh, uh, in this context, then it is not a, a, a an empty thing to assume that all of us carry this gift, the gift of sharing with each other in a way that highlights the gift in us, the, the genius in us, and in so doing, honors the indigenous in us. Uh, I don't even know why I say that. The, uh, <laughs> The end result is really that uh, we are all heading toward an ancient indigenous type of community. Because it is in this context where a new meaning associated with individual <coughs> become obvious. Otherwise, individual in modern context highlights and encourages individualism. The, the practice of being apart from. The practice of being special. And if you are special in that particular way, you are secretly acknowledging that most everyone else is not. That's why I have to occupy this gate, you know. I have to be special because nobody else is. And also, special is not going to be taste that good if everyone is special. You know what I mean? I mean, you're special, special, you're special, but it's <laughs> true. <laughs> anyway, so is this the reason why we live in a culture that is structured around winners and losers. Whereby we create something that looks explicitly competitive out of which we are interested sometimes only in one winner. And it is that one winner that we're supposed to give all our attention to. The hell with the losers. Uh, they don't exist anymore, but uh, not knowing that while we're celebrating the success of one winner, we're forgetting the wound that we're carving into the psyches of countless others who, can, who participated in the competition. Is it conceivable to think that a competition can lead to everybody being winners. Going home with a trophy. 
in strict modern sense, that wouldn't be too interesting. Mm -hmm. It is as if the more losers, the better the winner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, spirit doesn't like that. The ancestors don't like that. The earth doesn't like that. Uh, and we don't like that either. <laughs> Just that uh, somehow somebody set us up and we, uh, we give, <laughs> give a shot at it. Uh, it is therefore uh, some kind of food for thought to go toward that which is implied, not said, uh, under the guise of something that is deployed, that is made explicit. In other words, what is it that we emphasize on when there's only one winner selected from all of us? It is not so much the craving for winning, it's a craving for something else. In fact, everybody want to be like this one, who is the winner. And this is why, did you do that? Thank you. And this is why we're being uh, basically expected to pay greater attention to the voices that are coming from our heart, from our soul, and to test them against whether, uh, what source are they coming from? What is the source of inspiration? Is it the directly the result of social conditioning, cultural uh, conditioning? Or is something bigger than that, something larger than that, that has our best interests at hand, the one doing that upon us. And so uh, that's why uh, when Zane asked me to co-teach this class with him, I was quite, ex uh, quite ex excited about it. Because the point is, uh, there is something about participation that celebrate the human specialness uh, that you will not see somewhere else. There's something in participation that says that the participating individual is not an individualist. You participate because you want to get out of the gated prison you're in, into the village square, to make yourself known, to make yourself seen. You participate because somehow there is a sacred dimension to the other participating individual that are significant in your total becoming, which means how you grow, how rich you become, is proportional to the echo of participation that you encounter in a circle like this. Did, did you get the picture? It may sound kind of abstract, but it's not. Uh, this is what Dagara people will call a dance. And that's why dancing alone is not interesting. I'm participating alone. That's oxymoronic. And so, uh, that's why you have to stop and think and then realize your thought ain't going nowhere. Uh, it takes, therefore, the presence, the physical presence of other souls and other spirits in order for participation to have the kind of productive dimension that is in, that is intended to have. That's what it means. And it is in doing that that we find out how much refinement we can get to. We can st we'll start our participation with some garbage, you know, 
because uh, we're delivering. We gotta, we gotta break in. We gotta kick start. And uh, you know, when you break an engine in, the rhythm, the sound of the the engine is not always what you would like. But eventually, you're gonna fine tune, and the smooth sound of it is gonna be a revelation that you did not start there. But you had to go through the difficulty of coming out awkward and suitable. Sometimes making other people laugh at your stupidity before you can get into the smooth sailing place of smartness. A lot of people are so squash that the only way they think of themselves as potentially mustering viability would be if they were, if they skip part one, part two, part three, and get to the last part of brightness. Well, it doesn't work like that. And so this is why participation is an opportunity for us to dance with the spirit in us to test its capacity to go at certain speed on the runway, hoping that it's gonna take off and fly. You know, the first runway, you crash, because the engine stalled two-thirds of the way, and the crash is terrible. The second one, you know, the engine may stall, you know, one half of the way. That's already a progress. Still not good looking, but, uh, somehow is telling you that from point A to point B you've made some minor changes in the right direction. This is why they kept saying it is not about how many times you fall, it's about how many times you get up. How many times you're willing to get up after the fall. A lot of us fall and they wait there for a decade thinking that and, and let the world get better there's nothing they can contribute they can't participate in anything because they they tried and they were kicked down this is what we call the dictate of the predator telling you that hey look you must have heard of something called safety somewhere in the course of your life it is important to emphasize safety Because safe is good. And so don't take these risks because they are not safe. And yeah, that's what we end up seeing as part of the, the essential fabric of modern culture. The distaste for the absence of safety. As if somehow this is this this is signal of some kind of primitive primitivism and irresponsibility, dictating more recklessness. A place where leadership needs to be implemented, and some kind of avatar needs to show up with a pool of redemption to shower these people. With. You know. Then I think about, how can I talk to some of the elders in my village about safety? I remember 17 years ago, I tried to mention that. And uh, uh, that was because I was going through some kind of ritual that was really, really, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I happened to say that, well, you know, uh, you, you gotta, you, you gotta make it a lot, a little more safer, because someone could die, you know. <laughs> and one dwarf elder looked at me and said, uh, "Says life is fatal." <laughs> <laughs> Turn out it's true. <laughs> But then I realized, you know, this is this is what I learned at, at school, you know, you know, to be careful, you know, be safe. Otherwise, you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn to be safe in the most roughest way. You know? 
And so we get to these places where the quest for safety is competing with an ever increasing amount of the and safety in the world. In other words, it's as if the more danger, the more we feel or long for safety. <clears throat> There's something about that that means that sometimes, as Elder will say, if you turn and, and look into the eyes of that which is not safe, maybe you become unsafe to that thing. Have you ever thought about the other way around? <laughs> we can be unsafe to certain condition. It's not just the condition who have the monopoly of the lack of safety. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, um, so when all is said and done, um, the part of ourselves that is invited to participate is actually the part of us that is the manager of the gift within that is being asked to come out and take office. To sit down and begin to design the rhythm of contribution to the general wellness period. When we keep that one boxed up and muted what happened is that wherever we show up, we delegate power onto someone and we become passive recipients. This is borderline biblical. <laughs> Moses had been known to be followed by this whole line of people across Egypt and into the land of milk and honey, which is the desert, but. And then, <clears throat> and uh, it is as if he is a chosen, and the others must behave in such a way as to underscore his chosenness. In other words, when someone is anointed with a certain kind of power, that power is maintained and verified proportional to the behavior of the people who are expected to look up to that person. <laughs> if they stop doing that, then the person with the power is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up on a bad hair day. <laughs> Eventually, this is something that most leaders must, must experience for their own good. Uh, to get to that point where somehow you are willing to defer or insist on the royalty of the other who is deliberately looking upon you to do something that you know he or she can do to, to summon that royalty, that genius, that skill by making this, the, the place and safe. Yeah, otherwise, the hierarchy is maintained and sustained the king will wake up the king, the subject will wake up the subject, and the world will never change. The world will never taste anything different. In a culture, and I know that for a fact, in a culture that has dumpla, it is extremely fascinated by status quo. The maintenance of the same. Wake up to the same thing. No wonder. Modernity can be not unlike Groundhog Day. Uh, and we, as call it spirit for lack of better term, we who can hear voices that are not in the frequency of general broadcast, 
we who can have vivid interactive moment at a time when our body is deep asleep must recognize the truth that somehow that which is going on with us has the capacity to bring the uh, unimaginable blessing to this world and it will not happen following the kind of structure that is already set up because some of the greatest healers have never been recognized never been known and in fact if they were known they would have been assassinated long before they can do any healing and so it's important to recognize that uh, an individual effectiveness within this context might come with, with no public credit being given. Worse, it might translate into a kind of effectiveness that will never be verified by the person. But the longing to see the trail of accomplishment, the longing to, to collect credit for something done. It's kind of interesting. You know, at school, you take a class and give you credits. You know, two credit, three credit. Anyway, um, the scarcity of credits um, has also led to the deeper longing for more. And uh, when you depart from this state of mind, what happened is that somehow, something not unlike credit gets given to you, not by human hands. That's what I've noticed personally. Uh, and so it is this that uh, shows how aligned we are with other frequencies, not just with the frequencies of the dimension, but with other frequencies that permit a life in this dimension to be larger than us. Because as individuals, we're too small. And the fact is, there's something about giving, about sharing, about participating that looks like it makes you inflate. In other words, not, not, inflate is not a good word. It, it makes you grow larger than yourself. That's why sometimes between the giver and the receiver, the giver enjoys more than the receiver. Something that the, the giver gets that cannot be measured but which is extremely nourishing to the psyche. In this case, giving becomes somewhat of a transaction. It's a spiritual transaction that has the capacity to look like the person, the giver's spirit received instant gratification. And that alone has some deep healing in it which is why it's, it, it is worth pursuing. So when all of this is done and said, uh, what are we left with? Uh, I think there's something there to look at. Uh, and it started with a question. And again, the question I want to I want to limit it or contextualize it within the uh, within the the theme that Zayn and I plan on uh, teaching or sharing or uh, you know showering uh, uh, a tiny little group of uh, never mind. So <laughs> really has to do with how much do I know of my gifts. I hear more often than not people saying they're trying to find their purpose. Find your gift first. Know your gifts. 
it will inspire your purpose. More often than not, they go together. They're brothers and sisters. You can't find the one without the other. Uh, and therefore, in order to find your gift, you first have to believe that you have one. You know, no advertisement, no form of uh, cultural conditioning can get you that without your own effort at recognizing that as you are, you are irreplaceable. The kind of assets the world has that cannot be sold or bought. Period. This is not an act of grandiosity. It's an act of recognition of the immeasurability of the spirit within. It is a recognition that somehow we are drawing breath simply because something in us is so powerful that it cannot be manufactured or replicated. And when we recognize that, this is the route to embracing genius. This is what lights up spirit in nature. Because recognition, acknowledgement, comes with a certain kind of frequency that is broadcast around us that only spirit can see. Oh, animal can do that too, but trees, uh, uh, ghosts, and, and uh, any person who doesn't have what it takes to be in this dimension can see that. You know what I mean? And this is the kind that make them nod and smile and say, this is somebody who has made the breakthrough. And this kind of frequency has the power to affect others in a positive way, making them realize certain things without their being able to explain how they got to that. So I might always, I might always ask the question, I made this breakthrough in my life, but who do I have to thank for it? It's too easy to say, I did it all by myself. See, I'm, I'm special. But to think that perhaps someone's obligation, someone's initiative that is so unique, spread out like a blast, and the EM field affected me in such a way that I woke up with the skills necessary to make breakthrough. That's not uh, eccentric. It's, uh, it's viable to some degree. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm saying that just to, uh, to stress the point that uh, it is not too healthy to think, you know, democratically. Uh, you know, I'm not a political pundit or anything, but uh, it's not too healthy to think that this idea is wrong and this one is right. Uh, it is best to, de to defer judgment, to postpone it for a while in order to better understand why they even became articulated. What or who forwarded this text that this person read publicly to everybody? Most of the content stuck or not. When we do that, what happened is that uh, we find ourselves uh, cosmologically embracing the qualities of water. The capacity to flow, the capacity to shape shift. And that indicate that uh, when there is something we cannot fathom, it may be because <coughs> we have decided that the only way we can fathom this thing is to is within the specific set of frequencies. You know what I mean? In other words, something might appear indigestible. 
But that may be because we have already set a structure into which what cannot fit is expected to fit. And if it cannot fit, therefore it doesn't belong, or it is impossible, or it is absurd, or is illogical. If we were to, ch to change the frequency a little bit, we'll find out that there's harmonics. And so the resulting effort that we're being asked is to check on how many frequencies we have access to. That would give us the chance uh, or that much chance to access certain things that may be inaccessible simply because of the rather narrow number of, or angle of perception that we have. I know I'm not saying this quite right, but I, uh, one thing I know for sure is that uh, in order to be able to expand we have in the face of the absurd, the incomprehensible, to turn immediately to spirit and to the ancestors, as opposed to rejection, uh, dismissal. Uh, because spirit ancestors have a way of providing us with the, uh, with the material needed to make an alternative approach to a situation that looks like a major obstacle to our understanding. Or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, with that, uh, I wanted to, uh, to add the fact that uh, in the pursuit of this gift that we've been talking about. Um, there's a part of ourself that is connected to a big set of information in our bone. And that information is about ritual. How to understand it, uh, how to design it, and how to implement it. Ritual that are not inspired by recent history of what constitutes ritual or ceremony, but ritual that is so ancient that its methodology is something that uh, we know deep inside of us that it works. It is something that we can access after we have acknowledged ourselves as living geniuses. Acknowledge ourselves as carrying gifts. Otherwise, it's going to be a really, really tough excavation job to get to. And so all I'm saying is that uh, to be able to transcend the situation of that modernity has put all of us in. And it's not just here, it's everywhere in the world. When I go to Burkina Faso, I see the same thing going on. Um, there is a need to, uh, to reset ourselves outside of this, the preset paradigm in order to see what kind of paradigm we arrive into this world with. And maybe this is what is going to help us realize the seriousness of the kind of dumpler we have been living with. You know what I mean? Uh, this kind of illness that is directly the result of an endless editing to the point where the text of our contract only has one or two lines left intact. Uh, simply because it is a reflection of how bad the world is. It is, a, it is an elder statement that uh, we cannot be introduced to something so dramatic without the skill to deal with it. Those who are here to heal are always introduced to people who need healing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, those who are here to resolve crisis are always put right in the face of it. 
deal with it. Uh, so consequently, what we witness on a daily basis that uh, come as if it wants our attention, it's not there to disturb us. It's there to remind us that we have the skill to address it. And so, rather than sagging into this depression because of the, the, the endless decay of the world that we are being introduced to on a daily basis, why not look at that as maybe a sign, a sign that there's a skill inside of us that matches what we are seeing, that is telling us, what are you waiting for? Take office, like now. You know. Go to work. And if that is the case, it will be a, 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 a reflection that indeed uh, somebody else is working alongside of us, making sure that uh, we are constantly introduced to that which we need most in order for us to allow the skill that is native to come forth or something like that. So uh, on this note, I have to admit I run out of ideas. <laughs> Thank you very much. For that. So we have about half an hour left, so we'll maybe do a little question and answer. Before we do that, um, Maldon is coming here as part of a class. The class is the Poetics of Indigenous Participation. And so as a class, we're playing at these ideas, right, of participation and genius and ritual. And part of that is a ritual here, starting here in this space on Sunday at 6 to 8, where Maldoma and myself in the class will be hosting a ritual for the CIS community and everybody in this room and whoever you feel like bringing. So please come and support the class for that. Right? In order to do a ritual, we need people to show up to be part of that ritual. That's really important. Right? So, so please come to that. Um, we also have, we're starting a two and a half year training here in the Bay Area, um, starting uh, next Wednesday. So if people are interested in that, it's kind of late in the game, but please try to contact me and let me know. Um, and it's also possible to jump on board in the second session if you can't quite make it this time. Um, so there's little flyers around, contact me. Um, and then we're also, we just put dates in the book for a thing called Bay. So we'd be doing Bay here in the Bay Area, or at least in uh, California, um, in April of next year. And Bay is, a, is a, about this idea of purpose, right? This naming, like what is your name? What in the world did you come here to do? Can we articulate it in a word that might be your name? Um, so that's also coming. So let me know if you want to hear more about these things. There's an email sign up. Um, and beyond that, we'll just take questions. Okay. <coughs> my name is Amitabi, and my question is really simple. I would like to play with you. My friend and I do a playground with spiritual misfits. Okay. Well, he calls it Alter of Free Being, but I like playground with spiritual misfits. <laughs> and we would love for you to like come and kick it with us. And jump around and tell okay, so me what to do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna be the bear? Oh. I thought you were doing the right heat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our own gifts. Um, how 
how how can we make sure that our gifts aren't taken for granted? How can we make sure other we don't take other people's gifts for granted um, and take nature for granted? Uh, just because it just because it seems um, like that's what's happening and that's sort of one of the causes for all of this crisis and um, you know with, with a kind of absolute timeline stamped on um, the behavior of our you know the community here um, it seems like this ritual has to be has to encompass as many people as possible as soon as possible. So I'm wondering how do you, you know, just keep going with your talk. Sheesh. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the whole thing about taking someone or something for granted, how not to do that. Uh, it's not easy because of the conditioning. Uh, you know, I can give you an easy answer, you know, like be aware. <laughs> I mean, I'm not aware right now. You know, I'm aware of the light shining. So, and I think that uh, if, we, if we use human history, how we have changed it's always been by doing the very thing we're not supposed to do. You know, if there's, you know, you make a fire here, you say, don't put your finger in there. And you, and you still do. You'll find out why someone told you not to do that. You know what I mean? And so more often than not, when we take for granted, particularly in the Department of Spirit. Lord have mercy upon it. Because the way we will learn how not to is, is through deprivation. We will bump against a wall. But perhaps at a time when we cannot trace the incident down to uh, our kind of carelessness. <coughs> But if we are able to, we'll, we'll find out that this was the way for spirit to tell us, don't mess with gift, don't mess with the sacred. So all I'm saying is that if you turn, turn around that people are taking your gift for granted, give that to the ancestors, give that to spirit. Spirit will know how to deal with that. If it turns out that uh, people take nature for granted, um, there is no workshop that can teach people how not to do that. Uh, beside a general announcement, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but usually when you say it like that, you're inviting people to do it. You know, put a kid to bed and say, don't dream about a lion. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> messed it up. So, in the end, this, <clears throat> this is the reason why ancestors have a tradition of getting us to become aware of something that we need to pay attention to by way of whacking upon us. <laughs> I mean, that's not very elegant. Uh, it's, not, it's, not rather, it's not dignifying. But uh, the ancestor will not come to us you know, like a, a piece of light descending from the ceiling and bowing to us and with a very great voice saying, it is in your best interest not to do <laughs> They don't quite work like that. No. Instead, they, they drive you into a near miss, uh, head-on collision, uh, well, you get out there and you don't even recognize yourself. At least your grandmother don't know who you are. But eventually, you get the message. 
Because we humans are like that. It's when we get whacked, we stop, or we pay attention. Uh, but if we are told very gently, oh, go ahead, I'm busy. Uh, and so this is the part of it that is a little problematic. Uh, but at the same time, quite funny when you look at it from a distance. You know, we look like we have it, we have it under control. We're in charge. When in fact, it is at that time that we're messing up with the greatest dexterity. You know, and so ancestors, the only thing that is left is for them to take a piece of stick and whack us in the head. Uh, then all of a sudden we stop. Say, what was that? <laughs> so, it is not something to be judged as right or wrong, it's right or left, in the sense that, you know, if there's somebody who knows us really well, if there's somebody who knows how to get our attention, it's the ancestors. And if they've chosen this method of getting it, that's because they know that other methods don't work. <laughs> and so, you know, if you get to that kind of situation where you realize, whoa, I almost lost my life here. Mm -hmm. Take that as a sign. Don't think that it's a random, uh, random occurrence. Uh, in indigenous parlance, random doesn't exist. Coincidence doesn't exist. Everything happened for a reason as if there is a grand choreographer that designed thing and we run right through it. And so when that happened, it takes the form of an event that we hadn't, we hadn't scheduled, we didn't have that in our, you know, on our schedule, and then it happened. Uh, therefore, redirecting all the plan, or if not messing the whole plan out, then we listen. That's how it is. But right now, uh, uh, at least personally, I think that uh, the answers that should do should do a lot worse than that. Because otherwise, uh, we're messing up the world. The earth is being mistreated. Uh, life is being lost all over the place. Somehow, they should use uh, plan B, because plan A is not working too much. And so, if there is a way for us not to take things for granted, it will be a general cultural reawakening. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you take it for granted, that's because somehow we live in a culture whose frequencies tend to induce people to this kind of behavior pattern. You know what I mean? And so there has to be some much more vehement awakening. Uh, something like, you know, some people have to show up here from God knows where on a big ship in such a way that they keep, nobody can deny it. It's there hovering around San Francisco. <laughs> and no radar can penetrate. <clears throat> You know who's going to be happy about it? People like you. <laughs> Meanwhile, the whole government system is going to be super paranoid. <laughs> the rest of us who have been weird all our lives are going to say, <laughs> Welcome to Earth. <laughs> Teach us something. You know, you know. Anyway, otherwise we keep talking about, you know, UFOs and, you know, sighting. And uh, oh no, these are just uh, you know military training <laughs> stuff. Oh, don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> never mind. So <laughs> you know, enough of that. <laughs> um, so about midway through the talk, yeah. Um, you spoke about, um, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh -huh that um, those who have been made to feel unsafe, let's say by the colonizer, the colonizer makes the colonized feel unsafe, and um, 
those whose power has been taken from them can turn around and look the colonizer back in the eye, and, and again, I'm paraphrasing, to help them to recognize that they can also, that they are also unsafe, that they are unsafe. Yeah. And I understand, in principle, what you're talking about. I'm thinking about um, how we live now, where so, so much power, so many resources mm. have been appropriated by a few, you know, keep, their se keep themselves hidden, you know, yeah. so they don't have to deal with what they've created. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any particular examples, um, ways of thinking about how do the, you know, 99% say, mm -hmm. the people who really are even beyond our 99%, mm -hmm. who are so high, um, how might they You gotta understand, compassion uh, is reached through the gauntlet of suffering. If you haven't suffered in your life, it's hard to recognize it. Um, and the, the psyche of the colonized is extremely bruised. And the colonizers knows that. The colonizer is aware of that. And so the colonizer, being aware of that, prefer to take preemptive initiative to prevent the same thing from happening to the colonizer. The waste of resources, the, uh, the abysmal disparity that we witness on a daily basis, even in the heart of the colonizing force, is a reflection of the dementia caused by brutalizing other cultures. There is something in, uh, in my village that is called Pien, which means if you take something from me forcefully, you will never be able to enjoy it. You will waste it. It, it will just it will just keep falling out of through your fingers. You cannot hold it. Because the legitimacy of ownership is not there. And this is why even the the colonizer who now is full of compunction uh, I hate to use the word regret. <clears throat> and I decided to create all kind of humanitarian foundation, philanthropic initiative to help the colonized. <laughs> uh, he's not succeeding. It is not. You go to Africa, you see all these machinery dead. <laughs> Loads after loads of heavy equipment that were meant to bring uh, change by developing this place or that place. They die. I remember six years ago, the first time when the paved road was going through my village. The builders, a French company, there was a little hill. It's the sacred hill. They decided they're going to take that and use it in the construction. The chief of the land pleaded, pleaded. People joined him and said, no, don't do that. This is where the fathers of our fathers and our fathers, this is where they used to go do their the ritual. This is where we're doing our ritual. You're going to take it out in the interest of helping the population. They had to do something that actually was meant to take even further away from them. The uh, villagers had to give up and turn it to the ancestor, turn it to the spirit. The first D9, Caterpillar D9, that went against that mountain exploded. <laughs> and that night, 
Countless people would say this, there was a white unicorn horse that stood there, nodding at any person who was showing up. The director who had ordered that initiative to be taken died the next week in his sleep. This is a thing, this is evidence to read. Nobody paid much attention to that, really. They just, everybody kept quiet. You know, they're not going to say anything. Nobody went to the, to the company and said, you see, I told you. You know, God damn it. I told you. No. They continued to live their, their own life. And the next day, you know, they drug a, a, a white sheep there and sacrificed it to the spirit of the mountain, saying thank you, and, you know, and they brought a whole bunch of chi uh, children over, and they barbecued the, the, the lamb and gave the meat to every one of them. That was all they did. So what I'm saying here is that there is a dysfunction that underscore the ill distribution of wealth in this world. That, that can be traced down to how it was acquired. It is now that someone, call it legitimate or rightfully earned an empire, and is now, has now become so generous and so touched by the dismal poverty of the world that such a person uh, feel that it is his gift or calling or purpose to then use all of that to help. No, no. We're looking at the surface, we won't look at it that way. In Dagara culture, <laughs> in Dagara culture, um, Wealth is seen as essentially collective. Wealth is everyone, which is the reason why I've had problem over the years when I'm when I came to this country. You know, my father will will, will say, "I need this, I need this." I send him a hundred dollar. The next thing is, I need more because. He just take that, call everybody in the village, they came over, buy food and feed everybody. They what, can you send more of the thing? The thing is, you get to the mind of the indigenous, that they cannot have more than the other. Because that creates this kind of imbalance that eventually gangrened into some kind of dysfunction that in which nobody went. The colonizer is perhaps in greater pain to his day than the colonized. Simply because the fact of appropriation of something just for the sake of aggrandizement turned itself into a, law, a, a breakage of the law of nature. And eventually the psyche, the spirit, suffers from it tremendously. So in a context like this, it is the originator of the wealth of the world that we must go to and pray, Mother Earth. She will never give more to one child than the other, because this is not mother. <clears throat> and so any person, any individual who decide to accumulate, particularly in the fashion that we describe under, uh, under colonialism, is in fact disowning Mother Earth. And therefore, making himself or herself a neighbor disqualified from helping anybody. There's some time, some time when help I don't know how best to say it. Um, ill can come looking like hell. And more often than not, what is deemed as help to the other is help to the self. There's such a thing as guilt. 
that in the absence of the portion of redemption, send you out there scrambling. <coughs> Thank you. Donating here and there just to alleviate the heaviness of your heart. Not to make the life of those people better, because there's something about it that is a reflection of what you've done. Only you can know whether what you've accumulated is right or not. So, this is a very important question that you ask. I was at a conference in Vienna uh, on, uh, on the subject of security. <laughs> See, I don't know why they invited me to that. <laughs> and so they were talking about all the, the dysfunction, the dysfunction in Europe around surveillance and uh, the, uh, the genocide of immigrants and how they, they are mistreated. Uh, it was so ghastly. And then uh, after a while, the, the moderator asked me, Malden or Phil, what do you think? I said, look, you guys, uh, it has been your tradition to send a message to Africa that you don't have a problem that you are in, the, in heaven. And so by doing that, you've been telling everybody to come here only to destroy them, only to mistreat them, only to put them into the most ghastly subhuman level of life. The best help you can give to these new developing countries that you create in Africa is to tell them that you fucked up. That's the best help. Forget all this international aid. And, uh, and that's the aid. Recognize that you're not any better. You know. And sometimes that's what it takes. Huh? What did they say? For some strange reason, everybody in the room stood up and applauded. <laughs> Well, except for the expert who was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there was the mayor of Vienna, the chief of police. You know, the, you know, they are the one connected with security and so forth. They didn't like that. But the point is, is, is uh, it showed me how how world apart leader are from the people they lead. They don't belong to the same world. Otherwise, they too would have recognized the truth in this. You know? And so this is what tells me that uh, you know, sometimes help to the other is more about self-help than helping the other. And so that's why elders in my village say, be careful when a naked person offers you a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> interested in indigenous stuff. <laughs> I mean, you have choices. Huh? <laughs> well, that's how you look like to me. Uh, never mind. The, uh, what are you planning to do with respect to the thing that I have Shared this evening. Don't just write a paper about it. <laughs> Open. Share, oh, share it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just uh, went to add a comment. I really like the modeling you're doing here. I think you're asking us 
come to a place like this, one thing you got to understand, I've learned over the years, in 27 years doing this, that it is the audience that tells me what to say, mm -hmm. not me. This is why all this afternoon I started trying to jot down something I was going to say and I went not over it. Then I thought, I thought Bain could inspire me. He didn't go do a good job. <laughs> and so finally I just said, what the hell, I'm just going to go and do the same thing. It's just that doing this is not easy. Because I keep saying to myself, what if the audience does not inspire? <clears throat> then, oh hell, you're going to break. <laughs> oh. And so, I don't know whether it's you as you think or the spirit behind you that as you think, <laughs> or maybe both of you, uh, for making it possible for me not to chew my words, <laughs> to say it like it is. And uh, it's like, even though I walked into the room exhausted, because uh, I had to start coming here at 3 a.m. in the East Coast, you know, I'm still here. Uh, all of a sudden, you gave me energy. See, I started sitting down. And then all of a sudden, the tank was full. So, I got it. so that is the clue that I get that somehow the spirit in the room that you brought here has already welcomed me. And so thank you for that. And thank you, spiritual.